thank you guys for coming. <laughs> I want to keep this real informal. Yeah. So if you all have questions or anything as we're going, feel free to throw them out. Yeah. Um, we'll start off just by giving a little bit of a background on who we are and kind of what kind of knowledge we have coming into this, I guess. Um, this is our website with our app, and we'll talk more about our app later, but I want to start by showing you our backyard from when we started. So this was when we first started growing food, and this was our, this is our old house, um, but this is what it looked like when, when we moved out. Um, so this is why we wanted to build an app, because in the process of doing all this, there was a lot to memorize, you know, a lot to keep track of, and I am I'm hyper OCD and, and autistic, and I have a spreadsheet for everything in my life, and I felt like a gardening needed something more than spreadsheets. So. Um, Carrie and I started working on learning how to code and build apps and released this in 2018 and um, now we, we are working full time on it. So Park Seed bought our app about two months ago um, and they're paying us to work on it full time and to build out like all some really cool features we're going to be doing. So, um, so as part of that we're going to be able to do things like this every month. So if you all enjoy this, you know, come back next month we'll be talking about new stuff. I'm doing the same thing every month. We're kind of tailoring it to the season and carrying you all along the journey of, of what we're doing in our garden. And along that note, uh, Carrie releases videos pretty much every day from our garden showing everything we're doing. So, and like, we're honest about if we run into problems, it's like on our YouTube, um, we had, we had se seedlings that were leggy last week because one of our grow lights was burned out and I didn't catch it. So we showed that, talk about how we fix it and that kind of stuff, so. So we show the good and the bad, which is important, I feel like, because, yeah. I mean, we still make mistakes. I mean, everybody does. Especially starting out, it's a lot yeah. more bad than good. Absolutely. Yep. So we live on five acres now. Uh, we've got a small farm with a bunch of pigs and goats and a uh, whole bunch of farm animals, and they're all pets, and um, they help us build gardens. They're our landscaping crew. So uh, today we're going to be talking about how to start growing food and specifically how to start growing food in the early spring and what you need to be doing now. So we're gonna take you through everything that we're doing from now until we run out of time, basically. <laughs> so um, let's start off by talking about seed starting because that's the biggest thing that we're doing this time of year and stuff that we started doing pretty much last month. So Carrie has a lot of videos that's been showing what we've been doing with these biodomes. Carrie, you want to talk about yeah. these biodomes? And so these, we <clears throat> actually just started trying out this season and they've been amazing so far. Usually we've just started them in our shop just in regular pots, but I found that these, ah, oops, fell out of my pocket. Um, but these domes have been absolutely amazing. And so these are essentially, so the tray right here holds the water and you can water from down below. And then in here, these are just little sponges that come with it and they have holes already in it. And then you go through and just drop one seed in there. And I haven't had to drop more than one seed because they've been all popping up, which has been weird for me. Usually I'm at least dropping two in there and I'm like, I hope one of them comes. But like but, in the past, our seed strategy was real shady. Yeah. Like we just had a big pile of seeds and we were just planting all of them and just seeing, you know, a lot of them were expired or older. Yeah. And um, I will say, yeah, we have yeah. been getting Now we're doing all fresh, all brand seed. new park seeds. We're trying to grow every variety they have yeah. so that we can be experts on all the different seeds that are in our app. So, um, yeah, so these ones I just started yesterday, actually. So they haven't popped up yet, but um, these ones, hopefully the nice they will be coming is, up like, tomorrow. The lid is way stronger than the other ones, like the ones you get from the store that break like, for after one season, basically. Uh, these are meant to be reused year after year. Is that like a humidity thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so that's you nice can too. open the vents if you want to. So usually once I notice that they start sprouting, I've been opening it until all of them sprout and then I take it off. So this has been amazing for me for seed starting. So, As far as like what to sprout and all that kind of stuff, that's where our app comes in. So I'm going to show the online version of our app, but this is the same thing that's on. Uh-oh, still has the old logo. I need to fix that. We just changed our logo. It's this one. Um, so um, this is the online version of our app. So you can go in and you can see what all it's time to start now. So if you filter here by can be planted, then it's going to show you everything that you can either start indoors or plant outdoors right now. 
So this can show you the list of everything that you can, you can start now. And this is the kind of stuff we're going to be really enhancing now that we're full time. Um, the Garden Plus section of our app lets you log plants from your garden and keep track of everything. We're going to start using things like this to send you notifications. So you can choose the plants you're interested in growing. Then when it's time to plant them, you get a reminder. And then when it's time to fertilize, you get a reminder with a link to get a discount to buy more for like all that kind of stuff. Like that's what we're building out. So um, be looking for a lot more changes coming to Garden Plus because that's that's all we're doing now. Um, <clears throat> as far as like the specifics of, of seed starting and all that, it's it's really simple. I mean, if you even if you're not using yeah. something like this, I mean, the basic concept is the same. You just drop the seeds in and keep it watered. Yeah, and the big thing with watering for seedlings too, whenever you're germinating these seeds, you want to make sure that you're keeping it um, watered from below. So that's going to be the best thing to prevent any sort of mold issues on the top or gnats, anything like that. There's some other stuff we do too to help prevent some issues with, uh, with indoor seed starting. Like we have a fan that we, we set up mm -hmm. and I just, I literally zip tie it to the side of our wire, wire shelving. And when the plants start getting two to three tr true leaves, I start, I put the fan on one and then run it like that. And then every week I'll bump it up to two and then three. So it gets used awesome. to the Oklahoma wind. Mm -hmm. No, it's a box fan oh, nice. that I keep just yeah. right there, just zip tied right to the grow rack. Cool. So, and then by the time they're getting transplanted out, they've been hit with some like three on it. So, and that's one of the ways that we help overcome, like, so our seedlings are leggy. Um, that's how we're helping to repair some of them. Um, is we're exposing them to more wind, so they build up stronger stems. And are you pinching off or anything like that at times? So um, we got lucky in that these seedlings were all ones that you can uh, plant a little deeper too. Yeah. Okay. So they were all, it was brassicas. Um, if they were peppers, I would have done yeah. something like that. If but they it was, were tomatoes, definitely. It would have been great if they were tomatoes, because yeah. that's really easy. You can plant them as deep as you want, but yeah. even brassicas and some peppers, you can plant kind of deep too. So we got lucky that they were brassicas. Um, what other? Do you know what leggy means? Too, whenever we say leggy? Yeah, do you all know what leggy, like, so when we say leggy, what we mean is whenever the seeds sprout, they grow taller than they should, and they have like a very long stem that's like all scrawny and weak looking. And what happens is it makes those plants where they can break very easy, just like a little that will break it, right? Because they're, they're searching for the sun. So this can happen outdoors if you have a whole bunch of plants together and they all are fighting for sun, they'll get tall, right? So that's what leggy means. So you just got to make sure that your plants are close to the grow light, like as close as you can get, basically. And then that's the biggest thing to make sure. Like with us, we had a bulb that was burned out. But because we have like four shelves of lights, like it's just one we missed. And we've been so busy trying to get, like we're trying to plant every variety they have. And there's hundreds. So it's, it's we always commit to these crazy ideas. But, um, but that's the one we were on It's right fun now. to try, though. Yeah. We're on it. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same energy I put into collecting football cards when I was a kid is now going into collecting spinach varieties, but <laughs> keeps, keeps life fun. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that fan that he was talking about, it helps with the mold as mm -hmm. well as helps with like the hardening off process. So before you put these babies outside, you always want to make sure that you harden them off, which means to just get them used to the outdoors, especially here in Oklahoma. You know how windy it is and how, I don't know, how unpredictable the weather is. You always need to slowly introduce them to, uh, to the outdoors, to the wind, to the sun, to whatever their natural environment's gonna be. That's a big deal when it comes to buying transplants from the nursery too. The biggest mistake a lot of people make is they buy something from the store, they come home and they plant it outside that day. Well, that plant has been living inside of a greenhouse, like sheltered, and now you put it out in Oklahoma conditions, especially if it's right before, you know, wind or heat or whatever you name it that we have. So when we, whenever we buy plants from the store, typically what we'll do is we'll kind of phase them out. We'll keep them inside of a big tub that we can easily move out and in, and then we'll bring them in at night the first night. We'll like gradually introduce them to different conditions until they're ready to go out. Yeah, usually over a course <clears throat> of a week, we just slowly make it more sun and more time outdoors. Yeah. Which is great because usually like by the time we're, we've made it home from buying all these plants, we're too tired to plant them anyway. So mm -hmm. it's like, now you don't have the pressure of having to plant them right then. It's like, well, it's better <laughs> if I procrastinate and wait a week. <laughs> what kind of a light schedule do you recommend for seedlings? Is that like a 24 hour a day thing? Is that we like do 12 on, 12 off. Okay. Okay. 
Um, there are other plants, you know, that you need to be more specific about it, but for just starting seedlings and stuff, 12 on, 12 off is fine. Cool. Um, the, when things get complicated with light schedules is when you're talking flowering phases of different plants and things like that. So just starting seeds, the color of the light doesn't matter as much. We try and go with daylight color, but you don't need the reds like you need for flowering and stuff. Um, yeah, what, what other things do we need to talk about with seed starting? I feel like we're forgetting some. Heat mats. Heat mats, yes, those are very important for tomatoes and peppers. Um, we have really, so our wire shelvings are, are four feet by two feet, right? Probably about that, yeah. Um, and we have a heat mat that's that same size, this is the whole thing. And that makes a big difference in germination time for peppers especially. So peppers will go from up to 28 days 21 to 28 days of germination time down to 7 to 10 just by having a heat mat and they'll grow way faster. Got to water more often, um, mm -hmm. but it's worth it for tomatoes and peppers. Don't do it for like the cool season stuff. Um, it doesn't, it's just not worth it for those unless you're just trying to hurry something, you know, but. Yeah, I have two, two separate <clears throat> seed starting areas, one for my cool season and then one for the tomatoes mm -hmm. and peppers, all the warm season ones. So I usually just keep them separated like that. Let's, let's cover a little bit about why we start some stuff indoors. Because when we first started, I don't think we fully understood like why you start some stuff indoors, why you plant some stuff outdoors. And there's still plenty of things that we don't start indoors. So for example, any kind of root crop you never start in the transplant because it's gonna, the, the nature of that, the way the root crop grows, the tap root's gonna be disturbed and now you know, it's not gonna get what you want out of it. Also peas and beans, we never transplant any of, any of those. Um, and also, you know, a lot of times, like we started some lettuce and spinach and stuff indoors, but really it, it goes so fast outdoors on its own and it tolerates the cold so well that we're starting most of those just directly outdoors in the ground. And then we're doing succession plantings on it every week um, throughout that prime growing season. So basically the dates that the app has. So if I go to lettuce, um, there is the search bar too. I know, <laughs> I know. Teach him how to use his app, right? <sighs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, it's pulling dates for Colorado for some reason, um, so I don't well, know what's up with You can go change, change it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. I was I wasn't sure that this feature was going to work on uh, on web, you know, but I'm glad it did because I would have been embarrassed if I. <sighs> No, but I have some spinach, like I have greens right here that we're starting to, and I wanted to see like if these would sprout faster than the ones that we're going to plant outside. Absolutely, and yeah. so I'm doing my own little test with these right here. Hold on, I'm trying to go to Oklahoma. Okay. I'm in Slaughterville. That's great. That's okay. close. There we go. So there's our dates. So pretty much within that window, we're doing succession plantings every week during that window. And honestly, I'm pushing it on at least the back side of it. Typically you can't on the front side in Oklahoma outdoors because we've got a snowstorm around that time, typically, or it's real cold. Like February in Oklahoma is brutal typically. Um, but as, you know, we're trying to plant as much as we can throughout that cycle. And then we're probably gonna plant lettuce a little deeper into the spring too, because we can harvest it younger, you know? So we can harvest it at 45 days. So. Uh, once temperatures get above 85, you're not going to be able to get lettuce anymore. That's not going to be until mid-May here. So you're looking at being able to pretty plant lettuce all the way up until early April. And even then, there are some varieties that were uh, bred in Nevada that, are re that do really well with the heat. And I don't know the name of them, but I know that Looney, the Looney, Looney, uh, Looney, Looney Farm? Farm. The mm -hmm. Looney Farm at Scissortel Park carries it. Oh. And um, they sell some of that lettuce too but she specializes in lettuces that do really well here in Oklahoma. So I definitely check her out. Well, um, we try to extend our growing season too for a lot of our cool season crops by having them in smart pots. So that way mm -hmm. we can move them and we tend to like move them into the shaded areas during the heat of the day. That way we can kind of help hopefully egg it on a little bit yeah, further into the summer. 
-hmm. Yeah, that's especially key for things like spinach. Um, and also there are different varieties of spinach that you know tolerate the heat better. Um, but we're doing succession plantings on all of those throughout the spring. Um, the main things that we're making sure we start indoors, like that we're doing every time, are tomatoes and peppers. Because if we were to start those outdoors, we'd have to wait until April. If we did that, we wouldn't have a harvest until June or July. Right. So we start them indoors so that we can, we're trying to get our fastest tomato harvest ever this year. Park has a variety that's uh, the season <laughs> starter. That was like 58 days, I think. It was yeah. something really fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we're trying to get the fastest one we can this year. So like little things like that are fun. But um, I lost my train of thought. You're talking about seeds that we always start in source. Okay, so tomatoes, peppers, and then broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts and kohlrabi. Um, those brassicas that are on the like 70 to 90 day timeline, those ones were starting indoors and we're starting a lot of backups because of spring storms. Right. So if we get decimated with a hell storm, we've got another round ready to go yeah. that we started early. They're like our backup insurance policy brassicas. Cool. And we're doing a lot of, on broccolis, we've switched to doing mostly the sprouting or the broccolini type varieties because they'll start producing at 40 to 45 days um, and you don't have to wait for that big head to form. We, we do some of the other ones too, just because we like to have it a mix. And again, I'm most easy about collecting all of them. But if I had to pick one, it would be the broccolini, like the, um, those different types. There's a lot of different types. The Rob, broccoli Rob is another one of them. Um, and also with broccoli, the entire plant is edible. It's not just the, the heads, right? So the leaves and all that kind of stuff are all edible. So if you do get decimated by a hellstorm, just pick it we all up and that by accident. <laughs> chop it up and make a stir fry. It tastes amazing too. Uh -huh. I was actually happy that our plants yeah. got destroyed. Yeah, I was like, we were this at, like, is a in great the kitchen discovery. Like 10 o'clock at night with our broken broccoli making yes. a stir fry. Yeah, it was amazing. The storm. Absolutely amazing. It was so good. It tastes like the inside of an egg roll. Yeah. It's basically what it tastes like. Yeah, then that's yeah. that's why we actually went to the switch of doing more of the sprouting and the broccolini because they have more of the leaves and the smaller heads. So mm -hmm. I think it tastes way better too. We're growing a lot of peas right now. So outdoors, um, we're planting, we planted those today actually. Mm -hmm. Peas are great to have along any type of fence you know, or anywhere because they're gonna trellis on their own. They're gonna climb on their own. Um, they can tolerate the cold really well. And if you haven't had a pea out of a garden yet, you haven't tasted a real pea because it tastes so much sweeter than any pea that you can get from the store. So if you don't have a feeling towards peas, I suggest you try one in real life. Well, like one right off the garden, I mean, <laughs> that's in real life. I say weird <laughs> things sometimes. Um, uh, root crops, you can also plant those out outdoors now. So definitely do not start them indoors, but you can get them started outdoors. For things like carrots that take up to 21 days to germinate, what we typically do is try and cover them with burlap and then water them because then that burlap will keep the sun off of them and keep them, it's not as annoying, otherwise you gotta water every day. And if you don't water them, they're not gonna sprout. So um, you mentioned you have a drip irrigation system. That's great to set that to run every day on those carrots. Um, What's the, what's the like, duration of water you're yeah, supposed like to, you know, yeah. you're supposed to water deeply. But what is yeah, that, let's talk about watering for a little bit. Yeah. I apologize to derail. I don't no, 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 not at all. No, not derailing at all. So let's talk about different types of watering for different conditions. Okay. So I'm going to start with raised beds and smart pots. Okay. With both of those, watering is real simple. Water until you see water coming out of the bottom and it's fully saturated and then stop and then don't water it again until you can stick your finger down, not in the middle, but like halfway. So here's the middle, here's the edge, this halfway point, stick your finger down. And if it's, if it's dry to here, you need to water again. And you need to water it the same way you did before, where you completely flood it. And we're not scared to like completely flood the whole garden area. Yeah. Um, and then we don't again until Whatever. you're mimicking a heavy rain every time the plants get thirsty. That's the way, and sometimes that's three days, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's in the summer, it can be one. <laughs> so you're pretty dynamic with it. And it, it also a lot depends on pot size too, because like with the smart pots, 
a 15 gallon smart pot is going to need water less often than a five gallon smart pot. So that's why it's hard to calculate how often and things like that. But just the principle remains the same. Flood it and then check it. And then if it's dry, flood it. That's why the bigger ones are sometimes easier because <laughs> you can forget yeah. about it for a couple days and it's like, oh, maybe I need to go check on it again. <laughs> Another thing we'll do with tomatoes and peppers in the summer, more so tomatoes because peppers don't like this as much, but um, it, especially back when we used to like have day jobs where we had to go into the city and be gone for the whole day and it was 100 degrees back at home, we would fill a kiddie pool with like two inches of water and then put those smart pots inside the kiddie pool and it would just drink from below and there was no chance of the plant drying out or so that if you're busy and you're not at home that's like a hack you can do to to help with that but you got to be careful because you can get mold issues that develop you can get gnat issues develop if it's too if there's too much water so if you get three days of rain and then they're still in that and you forget well now you're going to have issues so like i I caution people if you're going to do that you got to do it responsibly and we're not always the most responsible gardeners shockingly i mean well and what we ended up doing with our kitty pools was we drilled uh, like it was like an inch or two yeah. like we would drilled holes every so often so that yeah, way if it did going yeah. it's going out yeah. so that way mm -hmm. it can't get too much but yeah yep um you can also go ahead and plant uh like any type of uh fruit tree or fruit bush right now. Not strawberries quite yet, but the hard stem, blackberries, raspberries, all the trees, um, those should all be fine to plant now. Uh, don't fertilize them yet. Just plant them, water them in real well, and then once you start to see the, the green sprouting after we've had our last freeze, then fertilize them. But if you fertilize them before that last freeze, it can encourage them to go ahead and leaf out, bud out, and then you know, the freeze kill them. So, but um, you can go ahead and plant all that now as well. Um, we were talking watering though. Well, we were done with watering. Oh, with the raised We're in ground. Okay, in you're in ground. ground. I'm yeah. in ground with, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to dodge that one because that one's hard. <laughs> so that, so legit though, like in ground watering is tough because especially in Oklahoma, we'll get those like four days of rain and right. now you're flooding. Right. That's why I don't really do anything in ground anymore. Um, if I were going to do stuff in the ground, you're fully raised beds and pots. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. We tried going in the ground, but it all got flooded. So I just said, nope, I'm just, I just put smart pots on top of it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things I would grow in the ground and we probably will be moving. It's things that like, uh, like a lot of water anyway. Okay. Sure. So I think like corn, I'd probably go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and grow that in the ground because it's annoying to grow in a raised bed anyway. It right. needs to be a big patch, right? Yeah. Um, a three sisters bed, still going to grow that in the ground, which is still corn and then the winter squash that grows through and then the beans that climb the corn. Right, okay. um, beans, peas, I'm probably still going to throw them along fence lines in the ground too. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, any type of green, I want to grow that in a smart pot so I can harvest it easy and not have all the wood chips in it and it's right. kind of clean and right. minimal processing time. Right. Um, any type of Tomato or pepper, I want it to be in its own smart pot. So especially early in the season, we can move it in and out. Mm -hmm. So we can start, like we started them a month ago, probably um, our first ones. They'll get transplanted here soon into like little five gallon smart pots. And then we'll keep them outdoors on nice days and then move them into our shop on the days that it's not nice. So, um, and that just gives us a way to kind of jumpstart our season. Sure. But typically all those type of plants we're doing in the smaller individual ones we did like blackberries and, and things like that. Those will go fine like in, in the ground. ground. Anything native. Yeah. Okra, I think, is fine to do in the ground, too. That works well in the ground. Okay. But think along those terms, right? Those type yeah. of plants are what, you, are what we do directly in the ground. It's mostly a drainage thing. And even if you want to grow directly on the ground and not build, build raised beds, yeah. just lump up soil into hills, yeah. like into mounds. Yeah. Mound gardening, it was a Native American method. I mean, I would say that, we've probably yeah. got two, three, three-inch mounds. Above, well, yeah, so you basically have raised beds, yeah, yeah. without any sort of framing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think framing is overrated. Yeah. So that's after after like building it at our old place and they all falling apart for four years. That's my official statement yeah. on framing. Is four I years think is probably generous uh -huh. too. Like, yeah, yeah, they're so falling apart. It's not like flat to the ground. It's considered kind of a raised. Mm -hmm. we, we do have some. You do have some drainage at that point and some other things. 
Yeah, it's taller than the soil around it, right. so that, that would be considered raised. Well, yeah. Misleading. Oh, no, no, it's all good. I think I mislabeled it from the start. So, okay, yeah, I guess we are sort of raised back then. Yeah, so I think for you then, just water it till you see the water draining out the sides of that and flowing down into those. You probably got the little valleys. Yeah. Wait till those valleys are filling with water. Okay. And that's we, probably a good indicator. We've got it on an automated system. I think I was more hoping for that. Oh, yeah, you know, every four days, 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, I wish it were that easy, yeah. right? Well, okay, I mean, I think it depends on the plant, too, right? right? right. Um, now, these are the features we're building with Garden Plus, where we're going to use how much is rain where you are to do these type of things based on the type of plant it is. So we know that lettuce needs uh, water more often than rosemary, for example, right. right? So we can have different schedules that we key off of yeah. that. Okay. Um, I wish it were that easy. Yeah. That's why mm -hmm. it's, there's no like easy answers out there. I, that's why I think the best answer I can give is the water tilts and then yeah. adjust that as needed. Yeah. And once you do it for a year, you'll start to develop a fill for when it needs to be for this long and you know, it'll just become second nature. Starting to get the hang of the, of the smart <clears throat> pot, both the feel and the, and the mm -hmm. or whatever. And you can tell by color on soil too, just yeah. by looking at it. Like yeah. if it's uh, that lighter kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. especially yeah. if you have like vermiculite in it, because it like kind of puffs up and gets all like dry, you know, dry looking and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. They answer all the watering questions now. I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Let's talk about fertilizing because it's kind of related, um, and it's kind of related to seed starting too. So we do not fertilize that much. Um, we don't really fertilize broccoli or any of those that we transplant because we're starting those just a few weeks early, really. I mean, we're, just, we're starting in mid-February, we're planting them early March. Um, we don't want to fertilize them because I don't want their roots to grow too much water in that pot and then exacerbate the transplant shock issues. Um, also, plants can go through shock if you transplant them and fertilize them at the same time, so I don't want it to be like, too close to each other. So with those, we're just getting them a head start indoors, getting them outside, giving them like three or four days to settle, then fertilizing. Once we see new growth development after we transplanted, like okay. two or three leaves, yeah. Yeah. that's when we're fertilizing. Yeah. Okay. Um, for tomatoes and peppers, those are living indoors a lot longer. So those we are fertilizing, but even then I'm not doing a full spectrum fertilizer. I'm not doing any type of chemical fertilizer. We're just doing like a fish fertilizer. Yeah or some sort of Alaskan fish emulsion, something like that, because the plants only need nitrogen right then anyway. Um, that's all they're using in the beginning is just nitrogen to grow. Then they need the phosphorus and the potassium once they start developing that's fruit and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're just doing like the liquid fish fertilizer, mixing that into the watering, um, like our, our watering jug, so and then we're bottom right. watering the, right. Right. and then we're doing that. So we start doing that once there's two to three tr true leaves, and then doing that about every three weeks. Unless I'm seeing, I mean, again, this will become second nature. You'll go off the tint of green. So if I start, if the green doesn't look the way I want it to look, I'll give it some extra. Yeah, that's, that's, that's expert level. Mm -hmm. expert. You'll get there. Yeah. No, you'll get there. It's, I mean, you're, we've been built to do this for right. a long time. Yeah. 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 It's the same reason why as soon as I uncover something that's green, I have every farm animal on top of it immediately. You know, like something that's been under plastic that happened today. With an instant, all the chickens and pigs were right on it. Like, you know, it's just built into all of us on this planet. Um, fertilizing outdoors, that's going to depend on the plant. So in the app, it has fertilizer recommendations for each plant. Garden Plus will be doing the whole reminder thing coming soon. Just to kind of give you a feel for the different variances that are out there. Some plants need a bunch of nitrogen and that's really all they need. So for example, spinach, all it needs is, is nitrogen and a lot of it. So you gotta keep feeding that fish fertilizer like every three weeks, right? Well, tomatoes need nitrogen while they're growing all their green stuff. Then when they start producing their fruit, they need the potassium and the phosphorus. So um, that's whenever you, you gotta give more of the full, like full range, you know. Um, we like to use organic fertilizers. Epsoma makes uh, organic fertilizers we link to in our app. We also rely on compost for most of our fertilizer. We're making our own compost. We're just, we're adding compost a lot. Probably like every week or two, I'm going through and just kind of adding some compost. Um, I've tried the compost teas and all that kind of stuff. I feel like with compost tea, I'm doing the same thing as if I just put compost there and watered it or, or if it rained 
because the studies that I've read and the experiments that I've seen have shown that even if you make compost tea and breed a whole bunch of extra bacteria and you put it in the soil, where the soil is going to adjust to how much life it, it can support. So you just basically, all those extra ones you made are going to die. Um, or you end up with an overabundance or whatever, yeah. whatever specific microbiology you have. Yeah, yeah. So we just do compost. Um, we've done worm bins in the past. Uh, worm castings are great if you can get those too. Yeah, it's fairly easy and you can do worm bins in the city too. Yeah. You can just throw all your kitchen scraps in there and they just eat them up and you can harvest. We need to talk about soil and yeah. what kind of soil mix we use. So for the smart pots and for raised beds, we do the square foot gardening mels mix, which is equal mix of compost, vermiculite, and then uh, peat moss. Now you can substitute coconut core for peat moss, and we usually do. And you can also substitute perlite for vermiculite, and that's just based on price. Sometimes it just depends on where I find it or what's available. But you just mix all those together in equal parts. The biggest part of that is the compost. You want to have high quality compost from as many sources as possible. So there's a place in Oklahoma City called Minute Materials that has four different types of compost. We get all four of those, mix them together. We also make our own, add that to it. So between all five of those mixed together, I feel like we've got a pretty good balance. Um, it's important to do testing on compost if you're buying from somewhere for the first time. We have a video on our YouTube that shows how you can do a test on it. Long story short, you put pea seeds into containers that are 100% that compost, and then pea seeds into a container that are like 50-50, and it, was that right? And then, yeah. and then one that's like all seed mix, and then you see how all three grow. Like, it's been a few years since we did it, so I'm a little fuzzy on the details on it, but that's the basic idea of it, because peas show uh, damage real quick. Yeah, they're like the yeah. twisting. Yeah, and it's important because we, we actually had an issue one year where we were trying to make our own compost and I was buying horse manure on Craigslist. As one does. Yes, <laughs> As you absolutely. would do, yeah. <laughs> and the lady that I was buying it from had horses that were like, she was training horses. These horses were grazing on fields that like she didn't have control over. Well, some of them were grazing on fields that were sprayed with amino pyrrolid, which is a broadleaf herbicide that lasts for three years, like goes through the horse in the manure. Yeah. And that's what I was using, and I wrecked every tomato I had that year. Yeah. Um, so that was when I started really upping our animal game, and we went the giant rabbit way, and, mm -hmm. um, and now we have, have way more poop than we can even handle. Do you have yeah. a, try, I guess, a good way of doing your compost? Like, do you have a specific bin you like, or do you just kind of piss <clears throat> off an area and turn it? Or, like, what, hmm. we tried our compost pile, and it, it didn't we're in a very treed area as well. So we ended up with a lot of sticks and a lot of yeah. things that were just making it tough to, to break mm -hmm. down fully too. So it finally just dawned on me that I could just like build a little tarped area and do it under there. But if you have any tips. Or... I uh, liked our, our one at the old house. We, we built the three. Me, uh, I bet if I, we built like one that looks legit. It should be at the old house. Like one of the ones you're supposed to do if you go to Pinterest and it says you're supposed to build compost. Like, look at this That's one. That's ours. Like, yeah. Yeah, we did that. I would not do it again. Okay. Um, because, like, you've got to move all the compost right. from one pile to the next. Having these barriers, and now you're, like, going this and then, like, up and over or this and then this thing. Yeah. It all sucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it all made me think, I just need to have a pile that I move from here to there. I don't need all this other stuff involved. Right. Right, I just need a giant pile and then another place to move it to. And I need to not care if anybody thinks it's ugly. So yep, that's my compost. Pile method is the best. I think so. Yeah. And then, then you can just move it from there to the other one right. and then move it back and forth. Right. That's, if I were to do it again in the city, I would just do that. But Pinterest said I was supposed to build that thing and yeah. it looked good. It did look really nice. And the kids you know? loved it. The bins and you could yeah. turn them. And oh yeah, it was great. Oh, the, those are horrible. Okay. Those like spin, but those are great for mixing soil. Like, yeah. Oh, for, like, your and oh no, because like you need the biology in the ground into the. That's why when I see those things are up in the air, I'm like, what? <laughs> like how? Right. You need the stuff down there. And I was reading too, it, you can um, drown things really easily in there too, so you end up with more anaerobics and yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and they get too hot, and it's just like 
those are, they're not made for serious composters. Those are made for people that live in an apartment in Denver that have a giant balcony that they want to compost on, right? right? Maybe, maybe somewhere else. I don't know if that's the right place, but not here, not in the Oklahoma backyard. We got big enough backyards just to do like a real compost pile. Um, you said you, like the, the wood chips and stuff I think are really good. I mean, you need carbon in it. Um, well, like, like, it's like hunks of oak. You know, yeah. like oh, it's, it's not just like wood chips. It's okay. Know, our street is tall oaks, and it's not. It's Have not you heard of you know, Hugo H culture gardening? Mm -hmm. Check it out. You might dig it. It's a German gardening method where you build, you pile a bunch of wood, dead wood, and then you build the gardens on top of that, and then those the wood acts as a sponge basically. Interesting. And then, um, so if you have an abundance of those, yeah. and you, you kind of, I think you might, you might dig that way. I was just reading um, Teeming with Microbes. Have you read that? Mm -mm. Kind of Who's it by? I couldn't even tell you right now. Is that Eileen, Eileen, Eileen Ingram? Is that what it her? sounds familiar, yeah. Okay. I, so I've watched a lot of her lectures. Okay. Okay. I haven't um, read her books, though. Well, yeah, they were just, they were talking about even using wood mulch, but in a similar kind mm -hmm. of fashion. The Back to Eden gardening method. If you haven't heard of that yet, check it out. Okay. Um, we did that accidentally. Because that's what we did at our old house, where we had like a Bermuda backyard. We covered all of it with cardboard and then about two feet of wood chips. And then after three years, it was all perfect soil. Mm -hmm. And then after we did all that, we found this back to Eden gardening method, and which was the same thing. I was like, hey, we yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> but I mean, the, the idea came from we were hiking down at Thunderbird, and we had just like had a tough gardening season. And I see all this stuff around me thriving, and I'm like. No one is doing anything to this, so I, I'm like, mad, like a madman down there, like digging in the soil. I'm like, this is beautiful. Like, it's the wood chips, and so that was kind of where that idea came from. And yeah, it worked out. Now the problem with cardboard is it does like take a bit to to break down. Right. So right. it's going to be. I think a by year like or two so. or three years, it was yeah. it was gone, and we had beautiful soil. Uh -huh. yeah. And you, you'll see stuff online saying not to do that. I want those people to battle Bermuda, and then come talk to me. Because <laughs> you need it in the battle against Bermuda. Yeah, that's Otherwise, the only thing we were able to to find that helped us against the Bermuda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we just and another tip is find giant boxes, because oh, like cool. having 200 Amazon boxes and a wind gust comes through, <sighs> that's horrible because they all come blowing. <laughs> um, this uh, so that's what we do for our, our, our raised bed uh, is we we make that soil mix. If you're growing in the ground. You know, like really do, do a soil test because it's going to be so different depending on where you live. Yeah. And you can send those into your local like county office and get that. I mean, or you can just throw compost with the problem no matter where you are. I mean, that's that's going to work too. If you just keep adding compost, it's going to make anything better. But you might be like seriously deficient in potassium or whatever that you've got to up it. Nitrogen, you're definitely like nitrogen is like is, is, is it has to be replenished. So you definitely have to add that. And you're always feeding nitrogen, even during the flowering and fruiting phases and any of that. Nitrogen's always a part of it. Mm, we cut nitrogen back on, t on tomatoes once we want them to, to the produce a bunch of fruit. Fruit. Okay. Flute. Yeah. Okay. Um, None? Or like two to, you know, two, ten? Um, I'll switch to one of those like tomato specific fertilizers. Yeah. Okay. Um, or like a lot of times I'm just kind of done fertilizing at that point too. So okay. it, depends on, it depends on how the plants are looking. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm just going off of how they're looking and how they're doing. Okay. Um, we're doing a lot of co companion planting too. So every tomato is going to have a basil next to it or oregano or thyme or rosemary or sage, one of those herbs that help disguise the plant. And that's the biggest reason is because we're disguising right. uh, the plant from, from insects yeah. that are trying to find it through their sense of smell. Well, and I will say too, with the nitrogen, like we also use beans and peas to mm -hmm. help feed back in. Yes, because yeah. those are ones that actually take nitrogen from the air and put it in their roots, and, and they help the plants around them too. Yep. So would you do like peas, tomatoes, and basil in a similar kind of area? I probably would keep peas and tomatoes away from each other because they're both going to try and climb. What I would do if I wanted to use the nitrogen from peas or beans with tomatoes is I would just plan on planting my tomatoes after where the peas were. So I would have peas that I started early and then have tomatoes that I'm putting out a little bit later to put after those peas and have tomatoes you put elsewhere, elsewhere too. Right, but to replace those peas. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And then whenever you do harvest the peas, don't pull them out with the roots, cut them at the base of the plant, leave the roots down there, and then put the tomatoes there. And then that'll just help feed the tomatoes out. Yeah. And there's also some things you gotta be careful of, like there's plants that don't go well together. So peas and garlic are one of them. Um, peas and onions, I think anything in the alley family. Show them in here. We yeah, have. so in the app, if you go to lettuce and then you go to friends, there's friends and then okay. there's enemies. <laughs> yeah, so it shows you all the different things and then also shows you the pests that attack the plant. And then it shows you what to do with the pests, about how to handle it. And we so, do everything organic. We don't ever, right. we don't yep. ever spray anything. Yeah. Trying to think what else we should talk about. We're running out of time. What other questions? What other plants have we not talked about that y'all want to hear about? I've been over it so yeah. much. Oh, no, no. I, I, like I said, I'm certain. <laughs> do you have any questions? Well, I do want to do like a, um, avocado. Avocado? Uh, avocado is a tough one in Oklahoma. <laughs> um, you have to bring it indoors in the winter, and you have to keep it from being outside if it's going to be below like probably 50 degrees. Um, don't quote me on that degree because I haven't grown it myself. I just know that it's, we we're not going to grow it until we have a greenhouse. Um, now we tried like with lemon and lime, we tried to keep those alive over the winter. We've never been good at keeping plants no. alive over the winter. It, what always happens is we'll have a nice stretch of 80s. I move them outside and then I forget to bring them inside before it's cold or I, I forget. It never or, fails. Or we have to, yeah, every time. So I just, I'm very bad at it. I'm, very, I'm a very bad gardener. <laughs> I'm bad at trellising. I always forget to trellis and then they go wild, but... Um, we get a lot, though. Yeah, just grow enough. Grow a lot, you'll get, you'll get food. What other plants are like, just definitely don't try in Oklahoma? Celery. Okay. It needs a very long time if temperature's below 80. Um, cilantro, just understand there's only certain months you can grow cilantro and switch to uh, Vitmini cilantro in the summer because it tastes just like it. Sometimes, well, some people don't. Some people, it's just a genetic yeah. thing. You might like it, you might hate I it. Love, I love cilantro, but I cannot stand the, what, raw ram? Is yeah, the Vitmini yeah. cilantro. I, I, cilantro. Yeah, I cannot stand I it. Stand oh, really? Cilantro, but I wonder if maybe. Yeah, it's very interesting. <laughs> Does it taste like soap? Yes. Yeah, yeah. it's it, very interesting. It wreck any bite of food I've ever Yes. Had. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Like but it's I'm interesting because like cilantro is fine for me, but the other one is yeah. not. It tastes just like yeah. soap. It tastes like soap. Yeah. 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 Um, maybe I have it, but <laughs> So maybe try it. Yeah. <laughs> Big tomatoes can be hard. Okay. Um, the cherry tomatoes are the easiest. The uh, determinate tomatoes are my favorite. So like Romas and things like that that only grow to three to four feet tall, put out all their fruit, and then stop. Um, those are my favorite tomatoes to grow. Those are the easiest to grow. Um, some fruit, apples can be tough in Oklahoma. Uh, or not, well, depending on the variety. I mean, um, peaches are very hard to grow in Oklahoma. Pears are the easiest tree to start with in Oklahoma, probably. Okay. Um, Any tips on starting the fruit tree? Haven't done it. I've always just bought transplants on yeah, it. Okay. Um, I just I don't want to be heartbroken. By yeah. growing this tree for five years and then yeah. determining that I had grown one that couldn't produce. Right. Right. So I don't want to take that risk with my emotional <laughs> state, you know. One of the, one of the reasons I have right? I Yeah. Get it. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Um, Carrie, what else is hard? Um, squash is very difficult because of squash bugs. Oh, squash bugs. Oh. And because of squash vine borers. Huh. If um, you could get past them, it's amazing. Yes. Oh, and it will give you a whole bunch of, of squash and it will be amazing. Everything sort of in that family, or like really specifically? Um, just anything in that, yeah, summer squash, yeah. or like even pumpkins. Pumpkin. They attack pumpkin too, so yeah, winter yeah. squash too. Okay. We just yeah, there are some squash oh, that they don't attack. They the are fun. Squash okay. that have like a solid stem. Um, some of those they don't attack. So there are things you can do to help prevent it. So once they start growing, if you wrap the base with aluminum foil. It helps this, it prevents the vine borer from being able to go in there and lay its eggs. Sure. Mm -hmm. But, and then just always being out there and looking under the leaves for squash bug eggs. Basically. That's really all you, yeah. yeah. And as long as you can keep them off, we it'll be great. We would pay our kids yeah. uh, a bounty. We did. They, they found yeah. eggs. Yeah. Or, yeah. They got a quarter each time they found one. Yep. Yep. 
Then they all grew caring about quarters. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one day Daphne got like 20 of them. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now we're competing with TikTok. Huh? Um, <laughs> cauliflower, it's difficult to grow white cauliflower. You just have to be diligent because you have to keep it covered. So we grow purple instead. Because yeah, yeah. I'm it's growing, it's easier. called graffiti variety. Yeah, it's oh. bright purple. We, I mean, we did see some. No, it's not. Yeah. I am so excited. And they, yeah, they said even when you cook it, it's supposed to retain the beautiful purple color. I am so oh, excited yeah. for it. Yeah. What about uh, rhubarb? We haven't cool. grown it yet. Hey, we have we not. want to. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't heard anyone say not to do it. Okay. I'm just looking so that the means to try it. <laughs> That's yeah. how I always think. Just, just try it. Mm. That's pretty much it, though, as far as things that are overly difficult. Yeah. yeah. And I guess most stuff, if you're in smart pots, you can bring in and out. And, you know, exactly. Kind of yeah. Of and I think kind of back to the broccoli thing I was talking about earlier. Like, um, I wouldn't try and grow giant varieties of things because that takes a lot of time of things not going wrong right and between pests and storms and everything here like we like to grow things that produce quickly yes that makes sense. and smaller are you guys like selling to markets oh or? no that sounds horrible yeah. <laughs> no we we uh -huh. we grow for us this to is my eat, hobby and my mental health and, thing yeah i'm a software developer so i need something real life to balance that <laughs> oh you too <laughs> yeah I, I know that one well yeah yeah, but the size thing, it goes with like watermelons too. It's yeah. really hard to grow like the really big watermelons. Right. So yeah. we usually do like the really small watermelons when we grow it here. Okay. And those do a lot better for us. Yeah, cucumbers, anything, like all uh, pumpkins, all of them. Start sm with smaller ones, you'll have more success and it's not as much of an emotional gamble. Give more inspiration throughout too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good place to start and then work your way towards the bigger ones. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But make sure you check out our YouTube uh, channel in the videos tab in our app. I just subscribed. It pulls in uh, all of our videos in here too. Oh, nice. cool. And then our blog posts and everything come into here. And uh, yeah. What other questions do you guys have? I'll just be binging. <laughs> <laughs>
these Mediterranean herbs came from the same part of the world that a lot of these bees did. Because these bees were brought over from Europe and these herbs originated in Europe. So if there's one thing I can recommend growing above anything else, it's going to be all, everything in your Italian seasoning. You know, rosemary, sage, thyme, lavender, not lavender. Um, that's just another one that's good to grow. Yeah, lavender too. <laughs> Yeah, I recommend doing an annual lavender and just understand that's going to die because it produces way more than the perennial lavenders do and they do better here. So just grow lavender as an annual and do one of the annual ones. Uh, the French lavender, I think, is the one that... Don't quote me on that, though. Um, Prairie Wind Nursery, look him up on Facebook. His name is Bill Ferris. He has specialized in those herbs in over 30 years here in Oklahoma. So pretty much anyone that has those herbs has got it from him at some point. And he's, um, he used to have a nursery in Norman, but he sold it. And now he's doing events only. So he's at Scissor Tell a lot. Or, oh, or here, May 7th. Great. Okay. Okay. For our, uh, our garden chat. Oh, cool. Great. Yeah. Uh, I would check that out and definitely go to his booth. Because um, he's going to have, like, the thing I love about his, his setup is he'll have, like, 14 types of basil like all the different flavors and same with all the, I've collected them all. So yeah. it uh, brings, brings some money. He's not joking. Yeah. Yeah. We're, he, we're he's done the, them all. The herbs and yeah, for sure. Yeah. That part. Okay. Yeah. Check him out. Well, and too, and he's tested like all the rosemaries too. Like he's the one that. Yeah. He, he produced, like he used to produce a million rosemary plants a year because rosemary oil is used in preservation. So he was producing like a million plants a year that they were extracting the oil. So he specialized in, in rosemary and learned all about it and learned about which for, like he did trials for osu for which ones wow. do best in oklahoma so it's fun buying from him and it's fun just talking to him too he's, he's like a cowboy you know like a like sam elliott you know kind of he's he's so cool to hang out with we used to do home and garden shows where we would set up and do these classes the entire day like five a day um just non-stop so, and he would, he would help us with those classes and stuff yeah. sometimes, but, yeah. Yeah, but Rosemary Arp, if that's, if you're looking for a Rosemary, yeah, Arp that's, the that's the one that does really, really well here. Yeah. Rosemary what? Arp. A-R-P. A -R -P. Yeah. And don't buy your plants from uh, a big box store. I just want to call it so I get sued. Don't buy those plants. Well, they're um, just not well taken care of. That's the biggest doesn't... reason. Yeah. Tougher to recover from whatever yeah. stress they've been under, basically. Well, they've also been hit with a lot of fertilizer to make them look better than they really are. Certainly true. So as soon as that stops, now they, you know, they don't know what to do without their, their fertilizer. I mean, honestly, we just prefer to start our own from seed. That way mm -hmm. we know that we're taking good care of them. Absolutely. We know how they've been their entire life. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, um, my favorite nursery around here is Earl's Nursery up in Choctaw. Um, I think it's technically Hera. It's Hera, like right on the yeah. edge, but I think it's technically Hera. Um, that, or I really like to buy from vendors at Scissor Tell Park or at like the, the Garden Fest. They say, like usually I'll hit up those mm -hmm. by like two, two whole cases worth and then that's, we're done for the year. Also like the farmer's markets, the Norman farmer's market has a lady that knows everything about tomatoes. She's been at the farmer's market for 30 years probably, and she, you could just ask her a variety and she could talk a year off about it, right? <laughs> so I like to buy from her, right? I'll go hang out with her for 20 minutes, talk to her, buy a whole case from her. And so um, we're not doing that anymore because we're trying to grow all of our own, but, but if we were buying transplants, that's what we would be doing is hitting up those places. Even more than like some of the bigger nurseries, because a lot of those bigger nurseries are all getting their plants from the same big greenhouse it's it's probably the one in Guthrie so it's at least coming from Oklahoma right. um, but I just like I like plants that have been loved sure. you know sure. not ones that were just part of the just another number you know mm -hmm. uh-huh yeah yeah so I, I know that they're not going to skimp on the soil mix or whatever it is you know and not that anyone else does I just those are the ones I that I like to support. And it's like, it's fun dropping $200 on someone at Scissor Toe Park and like seeing them, like how much that impacts their, you know what I mean? Like that's a better experience than buying it from, 
insert name, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so. No, we don't ever sell anything. No, we just grow for us and yeah. friends and family. It's just our hobby. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't like dealing with people outside of this. <laughs> <laughs> Selling to people sounds horrible. That sounds so scary. You're on like five acres now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is all of it productive? No. Yeah. No, it's like 95% the animals right. at this point. Yeah. Okay. Like, and then so we it's have productive for them. electric right, fences right. around where the garden can be, <laughs> okay. and everywhere else is all of it. Yeah. We basically built our buckle wilderness in our in our house is what we tried to do. So we just walk outside and there's pigs walking up to us and all these animals and <laughs> Oh, it's amazing. It really amazing. is. It's amazing. Yeah, I love it so much. It's yeah. like my it's my therapy. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, we absolutely will. I would love to have that. We have a 100 pound German shepherd. So like cuz we're going to get chickens and stuff and we can't because Not anymore. Oh. So See, our, we have a German Shepherd. He's actually, he's actually pretty good. For, we have to watch him, but... We've had to train him. Yeah, he... It took, it's taken some while. The girl, though, she will not. She's going to eat every chicken every time. Yeah, yeah. we have to. We have a boy and a girl. Yeah. I guess they, you will with a 22-pound rabbit or whatever. <laughs> well, they're, they're in a separate They all area. have, like, a dog... Like, the, the rabbits have, like, a dog She run. was born today, this oh, little girl. Yes, yeah. this was our baby lamb. And then, look, the cow... Um, <laughs> Oh, it'll be in a second. <laughs> oh my goodness. That, that's a cow over here on the right. Oh, like. Oh, oh my gosh, oh. it's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. That is we a holy cow. We got it from a monastery. <laughs> it is. Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Do birds ever fly in and tie your hair? Into oh, well, there we go, right there. I had birds flying up on me right there, too. Look at these pigs. They, they love to go scratch on stuff. Is that a pot Yeah, these are yeah. baby pot bellies. I had, I had pot belly pig growing up as a pet, and we'd walk him on a leash. You want another one? <laughs> you want another one? <laughs> we have babies. I lo I lost one of them through the pot, and he started trying to attack me. So oh, no. But they were always great pets. Oh, yeah. So, okay, seedlings. When... Remind me, I'm sorry, when do you pinch off, when would you not? Like, if, if they're, if they're like, I guess I've just recently learned that people even pinch off things. Oh, the peppers? Is it just largely peppers? It's normally peppers, peppers, they do that, and I don't do it. Okay. Um, maybe I should. We've done it before, but. I didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, with, with cannabis, there's topping, as they call it, but it's yeah. just pinching it off, basically, to force new growth, and it's a mm -hmm. stouter plant, but, you know, whatever. I'll do that with basil, but it's once it's full size. Like, I'm not doing it when it's a baby. Yeah, okay. You know? Uh -huh. And I'm not really doing them with peppers at all. Like, maybe I should. Maybe it's a mistake, but I've never had issues that have made me need to. Like, I just... This is, yeah, this is, like, third set of true leaves kind of thing. Definitely yeah. I mean, I, I did, there's definitely pe um, people on, on YouTube that do it, and I've seen them do it, and I tried it one year, but I didn't, I didn't see enough of a benefit from it. Yeah, cool. And... And it kind of stunted the plant a little bit, and but it could have been the cold too. Like peppers are easily stunted. If it gets cold, they'll yeah. they won't recover like some some other plants will. Okay. I just love my peppers, and I don't want to mess them up. So I just I try like the idea of topping them just doesn't. How realistic is the concern with like um, I don't think cross pollinating pollinating is the term that I want necessarily, but having like mm -hmm. I don't know like a pepper plant and a tomato plant, and the tomato ends up hot because of the pepper. Or, well, you know, the pepper, two peppers next to each other. Yeah, that's a common misconception. So yeah. what would happen is that would only affect the future plant. So you have pepper A, pepper B. Yes. Their baby would be who knows. And that makes a lot so if you're sense. saving yeah. seeds, it's definitely a concern. Okay. But if you're not saving seeds, then it's this grow and this grow cannot cannot impact each other yeah. exactly. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes my head feel better. Yeah, so we grow, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we grow bell peppers next to hot peppers. I mean, yeah. we don't. I think yeah, eventually we'll want to save seeds, and I'll yeah. have to start being more careful about that. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, we haven't been. Yeah. Okay, cool. We could look at more pig stuff all day. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And did you guys all get, like, emails about directions and everything? Did you? Yeah. Well, like, No, I didn't look at anything okay. this morning. But. Well, I sent an email out, and that's my work email that I 
Oh, great. And so I can, if you guys had that, that means I have your email and it's working, and I can send you guys information about like the farmer's markets and the That'll bar events and all of that awesome. stuff that you guys want. I called this morning. How are you? Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, yeah, nothing in my spam either. But yeah, we'll definitely do that. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? Appreciated all the questions. They were yeah. awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you it was a good time. You, you needed <laughs> someone here to, to be able to talk to you and that understand, you know, yeah. watch YouTube and stuff all day long. And people it's like different. Oregon and yeah. San Diego, you know, different climates. And yeah. And it's, it's helpful to be able to. Sometimes a considerable amount of effort involved into that experiment that might be just trash to even be trying or you know, whatever. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. some, some of those kinds of things do kind of keep me hesitant because then, yeah, you end up wasting six months or a year or yeah. something. It's like, oh, well, that was frustrating, frustrating mm -hmm. and crappy. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. Yeah, and definitely if you're just beginning out, you need to have it be successful. It needs to be good. Yep. It's very important. Repeatable. Easy. Yes. It's kind of why I'm liking that um, the Korean National Fund and the, mm -hmm. the, the dam uh, stuff is like you lop off the top of some, it's like you make like something called fermented plant juice. Like you just lop off the top of uh, some fresh plants, get some just like you good microbiology from a from a old forest, right? You've mm -hmm. got your, your good microbial activity. Um, those two things, uh, I think it's equal parts brown sugar. Molasses and, or something? It's, it's not specifically not molasses. Really? Um, but, but brown sugar. Uh -huh. um, equal weight to the plant material. Uh -huh. um, and then in with water. And then like it, it literally, like as opposed to an anaerobic tea or something like that, you can go, it goes aerobic but it ferments and uh -huh. then, like it's so concentrated you can use it supposedly like a one to 50 kind of one to 100 type solution it just a little goes a long way blah 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 it seems really easy and now i'm stoked to go check into it you know what i mean i bet i'd do it once yeah right and then think that was really cool and then go back to buying the other stuff because that's how my interests are right, like right right and i'm just yeah if, if it ends up repeatable it's phenomenal mm -hmm. but um it's just a matter of so try comfrey if you're looking for plant material for it, yes. try comfrey. Because it, it's, so its roots go like 30 or 40 feet down mm -hmm. and it pulls stuff up and sorts. So out of all the plants you can grow for that purpose, because I was growing the most nutrient dense stuff I could for the rabbits too, to feed them to get in their diet. So their poop was like, I go CD and everything. Right. Um, that would be like in a cover crop typically, right? Like in a scattering or something, comfrey would be. Here's the thing though, like once you plant comfrey, you will always have it. And it will, it's almost like bamboo and that like it pops up everywhere. Right, okay. So, it will attract a lot of beneficials, though, too. Yeah. Okay. It has beautiful, beautiful flowers. Okay. Does it grow natively around here? Though? No. No, um, but you should be able to find it at, like, Scissor Tail. Like, typically, I see it around yeah. places like that. Okay. Or you can buy seeds online. Do nettles grow around here? Or is that oh, yeah. You see, it's, it's a weed, though, is what people consider. So, stinging nettle and stuff it like that. Even though you can eat it. Like On the YouTube that I was watching for the Jadam stuff, um, frequently, Mm -hmm. with those properties. There's so many things that we spray poison on, like uh, dandelions. That's true, like, that's a superfood. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So many cool avenues. <laughs> well, I appreciate y'all coming. If Thank no you, guys. Thanks for this was fun. Yeah. yeah. This was great. <laughs> We'd love for y'all to come back next time. Yeah. You said every month? Yeah, every month we'll yeah. be doing this. Cool.